Okay, so this is uh, Aidan Duffy. Um, we're, we're recording today. We're uh, on our monthly call, so this is our second monthly call. And the subject we're going to talk about today is finding a new Oracle role, okay? So this is, is actually quite uh, apt for myself because I'm coming to what looks like it could be the end of my contract now. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going on, on mute if you're if you're not talking, um, so we're I, I've started in Pfizer at my current client. I work on contract for them in in 2004, um, and I've been working for most of the time. I left once or twice in, since then, but uh, basically it's been uh, since 2004, which I make it. Uh, 12 years, almost almost 13 years uh, in the spring of next year. So it's quite a, a long time, but what, what Pfizer have done is they're on a migration from um, Oracle to SAP. So Pfizer always did a lot of merger and acquisitions activity. And they when they took over Wyatt, um, Wyatt was roughly of the uh, equivalent size to Pfizer. And they had to figure out oh, uh, why it we use an SAP, and they had to figure out okay, which ERP system are we going to go forward with? Are we going to go forward with uh, with SAP or Oracle? And they had what uh, is called a, a beauty parade, uh, and somehow the people in Oracle managed to come in in the Oracle organization managed to come in more expensive than SAP. So uh, SAP was the chosen ERP. So what happens in that uh, situation is that because Wyatt uh, had all of the SAP uh, personnel and all of the uh, SAP experience, the power base from an ERP perspective and the real uh, the momentum and all the budgets start moving over to the SAP people. So that's bad news for um, our Oracle people like myself. So even though we started our, our rollouts in 2004, in 2004, in 2008, they started talking about uh, this beauty parade, and they've started the migration in 2009, I think, from uh, Oracle to SAP. So because um, Pfizer is, is such a massive company with, uh, with um, operating units and legal uh, entities in so many different markets in, I think, they're 14 countries in uh, Europe. Um, they have countries in, in the Far East, Australia, New Zealand, many operating units in Central America and North America as well. You can't do that in, in a big bang because it's just a, an impossible job. So what they did is a phased uh, migration project from Oracle to SAP. And um, they started that project in 2008, and there are very few markets left on Oracle now. So gradually, the, the, the Oracle team has gone down from, uh, on some projects that I worked in, we would have had a, a project team of the guts of uh, 100 people, um, sometimes more in the earlier rollouts. Um, and now we're, there are, there's a big off, a reasonable size offshore contingent, but there are six project managers left, of which I am one. So um, basically, the, the, the lifetime of Oracle, Oracle's in sunset. So once the uh, once the the markets are, are kind of closing up on Oracle, there's a possibility that there won't be any work for me next year. So that's going to happen in the end of January. Uh, end of January from uh, is it, it's a, a little bit early to start looking uh, on an immediate basis. Uh, right now, because it tends to be a quietish time of year, especially around December and January. So, but having said that, I have been making um, a few uh, preliminary inquiries, and I'll, I'll start talking to recruiters, including Connor, in the next um, couple of weeks, or maybe coming up to Christmas, to try to prepare the ground and see what sort of opportunities there are out there in the local and the, the European market. Okay. So um, it was uh, interesting that that's the, when I asked a few of, of you guys on, on the delegates on the call and in the WhatsApp group, what would you be interested in? And I think uh, everyone's interested in how to find a new Oracle role and what sort of opportunities uh, are out there. And so it's, it, it's a good subject uh, for the monthly call. And that, what I plan to do is talk a little bit about what I've done as part of my job search. 
Um, it's slightly different from uh, some of you, and though some of you are not in the Oracle uh, functional area yet, but the, at a high level, kind of the steps are the same. And um, I've been talking to Connor recently, and he agreed to come on the, onto the call to give his perspective from a recruiter's from the recruiter's point of view, so that he can. Um, because he, he talks to hiring managers every day, and hopefully he's going to give us some really good insights on um, on the, the the hiring process and the recruitment process. He also provided a couple of job specifications that we can go through, and we'll um, we'll take it from there. Okay. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah, so um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, confidence, okay? So any change requires uh, confidence, and basically what, what we need to do when we're, when we're going uh, to a new role is to kind of figure out, okay, um, how am I going to make the jump to, to, um, to this new role, or what's that going to, to take from, from my perspective. So I, I just wanted to show you this uh, slide deck from my own coaching course. So I'm in a business coaching course where I, I, I work out the, the best way to um, <clears throat> the best way to kind of to communicate with people. It's a, it's a coaching course, so I'm being coached. I go to London uh, one day in a quarter, and they present a number of knowledge tools that I that I'm licensed basically to to, to talk to you guys about as well. And what they're big on is that um, is this four C's of personal confidence, and it's something that uh, I've been able to implement myself. I look back over a couple of. Um, over the, the decisions and the jumps that I've made in, in my own career. And what I find it really useful is that it's a, a good framework for thinking about, okay, how do I map? How do I make the change? And uh, what are the stages of those change? Because speaking personally, if I have a framework or, or a plan to kind of work to, and I know what's going to happen, I generally feel a lot more comfortable about going through the, the current stage. So the first stage might be commitment, and I guess before we start, in general terms about confidence, I think confidence is is the single most important kind of ability that we have as as human beings. We need confidence to go into a new situation, and I think all other abilities sort of build on confidence as a as a foundation, and that the belief, uh, my belief, it's originally from the program, but uh, through practice myself, is that individuals with an ability to generate those confidence can learn anything, adjust to anything, and can accomplish anything. So some of you on the call might be uh, interested in, in kind of making a change in your situation. I know there are people who are outside functional at the moment, and to, to actually make the change it looks simple from the outside, but it actually it requires confidence uh, uh, internally from the, the person who's making the change point of view. So what, I guess what I find and thinking back myself is that people say that I, I would change but I don't feel confident and that I'd have to feel confident before I'd look for an Oracle functional role but the, or that I look for an Oracle role when I feel confident or I'll take a risk when I feel confident, but it, it, it actually works the other way around. You have to make the commitment yourself, and the commitment might be, I want to get an Oracle functional role, and then you've got to go through this, this courage stage. So the courage stage might involve picking up the phone and talking to a recruiter about having no functional experience but wanting to get into a functional job, um, and, and it's... Uh, I guess it's, it, it, it's, it's broadly speaking equivalent to, it, it feels a bit like a burn. So it, it's your ability to go through the current stages to kind of work through the burn, work in your, your mental muscles to, to make the switch from the old situation to the, to the new situation. So I mean, I, I guess if, if you realize you're, you're, you're not going to get to your bigger future, to your goals, and, and to have the, to achieve your goals, and, and maybe even reach the great life and, and the, the ambitions that you have for yourself, you need to go through the burn. So if you're, work, if you're willing to go through this courage stage and not hurt yourself and, and don't, kind of, don't set massively high expectations, but keep, keep going, 
uh, pretty soon you're you're kind of not so sore anymore. You've made the small uh, leaps in confidence to 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 get you towards that next stage. And then, so after you've after you've kind of you've, you're going through the courage stage, what you develop then is capabilities. So your capability may be that you understand how to talk to recruiters about Oracle roles. You know what to say to them. You're starting to develop some industry knowledge of of what's of what is uh, required for functional roles, let's say, and you're you're building up your capabilities about how to talk to hiring managers, how to do interviews, etc. And then once you've so you, once you've gone through the capability stage, then you actually have confidence. So you say, right, now I have the confidence. I know I can get an Oracle functional role. I've made the commitment up front. I've gone through the courage stage of picking up the phone and, and uh, putting my head above the, the parapet and saying, okay, I now I'm interested in these functional roles. I'm, I'm willing to go for them. Then you develop the capability about uh, actually working out what you need to talk to recruiters about and um, finally you get to the confidence and then once you actually once you get to the confidence stage then you sort of reach a plateau and you're what you, you're able to do then is start again and build up another goal make recommit to a higher goal and then start again so what, what I I know I've discussed this a couple of times in the coaching calls with you guys but I really recommend that you have a think about this it, look back on a, a, a situation where where you've made a jump in the past where you first thing is actually something's eaten away at you and you need to make a commitment to make your situation better and that's the commitment stage then stage two is the courage stage and stage two is where you have to it's slightly uncomfortable you've got to raise your hand for tasks where you maybe don't have the skills right now you've got to have conversations with people you don't know and then you build a capability so slowly over time courage turns into capability and after that you are actually at a new level of personal confidence so I guess what I recommend is, is looking back over the jumps that you've made in the past and try to map out these four stages and then to use this as a, a, a template for your, for, your, for your future commitments and to build yourself up into your future goals. So any, any questions on that? No, I, I, I just say I definitely agree with all that. I mean, it's sometimes the first step can be the hardest one. And, uh, mm -hmm. But if you just have honest, open conversations and just say, this is what I want to do, this is my passion, this is what I'm interested in, I think um, it definitely comes through and you can definitely hear it as well. When So I'm always on the other end of the call, you know. Um, so yeah. that's what I'd always be interested in hearing as well. Okay, sounds good. And uh, you have um, sort of gone through this recently yeah. yourself yeah. With, your, with your promotion, haven't you? Definitely, it, it yeah. Is, um, may I ask a question? One step. Yeah. Okay, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, um, it's just just relating to my own my own job. I recently got promoted, and I had to do a nice uh, presentation and do all these things, and um, just very open on the conversation, and saying, "Look, this is what I need to work on," you know. And that was actually my first slide, and then uh, also saying this is my strength, and kind of talk about that as well. You know, going for a new job it can be tricky, but you have to remember, like. That's what you want to do. You got to go forward with it, and you know I got a lot of no's before I got a yes for this promotion. So that's kind of that's kind of part mm -hmm. of the job as well. So um, yeah, I thought I thought the, the, the what you're talking about there was very relevant, and it's not just like Oracle function jobs. It's any job really. I think was quite good. Okay, sounds good. So um, I see your your guys' questions. Um, yeah. Uh, um, go ahead, Shastri. Yeah, Aiden, uh, it's a it's a nice. Uh, Still now, I was thinking about four C's about Oracle, but uh, today I came to know about four C's about personal confidence. That's, that's excellent. This, this is a one nice thought for me, and uh, which will be adding as a as a, my daily quotations I keep in myself. But now uh, here, adding here in this chart, there is one thing very much interesting for me that is called innovation. Now, innovation is a term; it can only show the uh, result, the results of innovation can only show when an organization joins in hands in hand with the employee and reinforces faith in it by investing on some budget on innovation technologies. The reason why I'm saying this, now 
I was recently like, a, uh, see, innovation can be sparked off through the uncomfort and discomfort of what every organizations are experiencing globally. I will tell you, like every, if I see uh, Oracle ERP systems used by different uh, different companies and everything, what they're doing is they're generating revenue or uh, or, 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 or the recording revenue or the, uh, they're paying the liabilities expenses. Uh, end of the day, yeah, so, they are, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Small question. Yeah, yeah. Last. So what I'm saying is, if, if, if there is a gap in the payment fees, uh, like you know, how we can reduce the fees there? Of, uh, You're fading. Shastri, I can't hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I'm saying is innovation, organization support is needed. Sorry, I still can't hear you. Okay. And what would be the... So um, let me uh, answer. So this is uh, innovation from a personal uh, perspective. We're not talking here about really a, 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 a partnership um, between you and, and your company here. We're, we're, we're talking about your, this is personal confidence, so this is your private and, and personal goals. So your, your company can choose to, to uh, be flexible enough to allow you to make these jumps. Uh, which happened in the case of Connor, and it happened in my own case because I've transferred. I've been able to uh, reach my own personal goals, transferring from technical to functional and from functional to project manager. But if your company doesn't facilitate these jumps, then maybe you're working for the wrong uh, company, okay? So uh, I guess what we, we're not really talking about here about innovation that's company supported. We're talking about personal innovation, like if you want to, to get into functional and you're coming from the user area, then you need to figure out uh, from an innovation perspective, what's, what's the functional job about? How, where do I fit in in the functional role? And, and, uh, and um, what, what sort of uh, what sort of benefits and can I bring to the functional role? So that, that's what I mean by innovation uh, in this circumstance, okay? So, uh, Yemi, you have a question. Do you, will I read it out or? So the question is, is for Connor. So what steps and approach is best suited? Uh, Connor, I think you, you can see it there, can you? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I can see it on the chat, but um, maybe, maybe you should just read it out, then I'll, I, can, I can answer it then. Yeah, so it's... Um, it's uh, what steps and approach is best to search for roles in Oracle if you are new to Oracle but you're a professional. Is it best to just upload your CV and wait for recruiters to contact you or do you also search for jobs, contact recruiters and apply? So what, what I would like is what um, I think is the best approach is if you go onto LinkedIn and find a recruiter for your area and then add them and then send them a message on LinkedIn afterwards. Uh, we all get mm -hmm. this uh, email overload unfortunately and uh, sometimes just to be be proactive like that I think is quite good because I think on LinkedIn um, you can showcase your skills a lot more and it's kind of more interesting mm -hmm. to see than a normal CV. Um, let's say you're not on LinkedIn, I, I would just um, I would set up a job alert for the type of job you're interested in on the job boards. Mm -hmm. so that means that every time, let's say it's an Oracle Functional Financials job and you'll get an email in your inbox and you know it would be good anyway or even now maybe you don't have the skills or interest just yet because you can kind of see the skills, skill sets that are needed and you can kind of um, do that. And then if you develop those relationships with the recruiters, they'll start calling you and telling you about the jobs, um, you know, even before they go live, let's say. So a mm -hmm. um, good example yeah. is I've got a, I know about a job coming uh, up in December, and it's not advertised out there, but uh, let's say if Aiden was available, I'd like, Aiden, you know, I'll give you a call. I know you're pretty good. Um, we have a relationship. It's like, what about this job? Like, so what, what would be good is if you do send a CV, make sure all the information's on there as well. Um, I maybe I can talk about the later in the call, or I can talk about now, like what's kind of good to put in a CV. But just to summarise, the best approach would be so add the recruiters on LinkedIn, and they put up their jobs on LinkedIn. If you don't kind of if you don't use LinkedIn too much, maybe uh, I'd say send an email and just say, look, I'm interested. I want to develop a relationship, and then have a really good CV attached as well. That's what I would go about it. And sorry, and set up the job alert. And yeah, that's probably the best way I approach it. Okay, sounds good. We'll talk. Thank you. Go ahead. No, that the uh, Connor's actually answered my question. So yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, good. So uh, let's move back then to the main deck. Uh, just give me a sec now. Yeah. So um, 
I just wanted to uh, talk about working with uh, recruiters, which we've uh, kind of covered there, just a, a little bit about how I do some market analysis and talk a little bit about CVs. I know connor has been looking at a couple of your CVs as well and about LinkedIn. Um, I wanted to, to just talk a little bit about how I analyze opportunities because sometimes you can have a can candidate stuff or opportunities to go for it. It can be difficult to figure out. And then Shastri wanted to present uh, some uh, documents on implementing process manufacturing and discrete uh, manufacturing modules. So we'll, we'll keep going. I think I want to try to finish at four or a quarter past if I can. So um, I think from a, a functional consulting opportunities, the reason we're, we're on the call is because we're interested in functional consulting. So um, I won't go, go through this in, in too much detail. For me, it's, it's why I trans transferred into functional from technicals because the better opportunities you're facing the business. I think uh, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of functional guys spend longer on the project. That's why we talk about the six key skills from objectives right away to transition. And the, I think the salaries are probably higher in general for functional than technical because you've got that business and the customer facing responsibility. If you want to travel for work, you can. I did a lot of travel earlier on in my career, and I'm less interested in that now. But if there's certainly opportunities to to go and see the world and see your definitely your regional areas. I did a year in Amsterdam. I did a year in Prague. I did a year and a half in in Brussels and time in Portugal and Switzerland and Germany. So I've um, if you have a an element, of, an interest in travel or a travel bug, then why not do it when you're actually doing, when you're working as well. So the other uh, opportunity is that you have the opportunity to work for yourself. I think uh, Funston has been very good for me uh, in that way. I've been self-employed now since 99, so it, it's kind of all I know uh, how to do at this point. But it's, it's a great opportunity from that point of view as well. Then, from an outsourceable point of view, if you're doing technical work, I think it's 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 more much more straightforward to, that your role would be outsourced. Speaking from my own personal experience, Pfizer had uh, 40, I think, technical guys at the start of the project, and uh, I was one of those, and I was rolled off because I wasn't really able to position myself properly. And out of those 40, there's only two guys left. I'm sitting beside one and I'm now functional and actually a project manager now. So I think uh, that's the way the market is going is that um, as a functional person, you're much less likely to be outsourced. And for those of you in uh, in India, et cetera, I mean, I think it's a, a goal for many people there to migrate to US or to Europe to work. So it's just to, to kind of recap on the opportunities that we have. So uh, working with recruiters, I mean, um, I think Connor sort of uh, summarized it there. So I guess from to, just to add from my own perspective, how to find a recruiter is to, as Connor said, if you're really brand new to the market, it can be difficult to figure out who the uh, reputable recruiters are in the market. So what I'd love yeah, is going to go the good ones. Yeah, the good yeah. ones are hard to find. Yeah, a lot of bad ones as well. <laughs> This is true, yeah. I mean, from, from the recruiter's perspective, you uh, by now I know when I'm talking to a recruiter if they understand what the Oracle market is about or not. And they, from the, the recruiter's own perspective, sometimes they're thrown in their Java recruiters and they're thrown into Oracle areas. So they're, they're just doing their best themselves as well. So it isn't always their fault. But if possible, it's obviously be better to work at, to work with someone who understands the Oracle market, let's say. So what I do is I go to the job boards and I'd have a look, look at the recruiters that keep popping up, set up your job alerts so that you can and keep a record of the local the recruiters for your area who understand the market. And then do, as Connor said, sort of introduce yourself on LinkedIn. Make sure your LinkedIn profile is up to date, and uh, just say oh, I'm interested in the, in the market in general. May not be ready right now, but uh, it would be great to, to catch up at some stage. So, recruiters, I, I mean, Connor can speak to this as well, but they'll have a number of immediate opportunities. But they they're also interested in developing their their medium term pipeline of uh, of passive candidates, people who may not be willing to move right now, but who could be a great opportunity for a particular type of client in the future. 
No, definitely there. Nail, nail on the head. Like, I mean, um, you know, you want to work with good people and, uh, you know, good people are always busy or in demand, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So you kind of want to build it long term and, and there's a few different things there I'd advise the guys to do, but I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through that later as well. But I thought that was quite good there. Okay. Yeah, and then so from my own market analysis point of view, um, what I've done, I might just switch to LinkedIn now, is I go and have a look at these, uh, you can look in LinkedIn jobs. Um, I, I'm a real LinkedIn fan, I'm on it every day, and um, I can, I can, I use it really to build up my industry knowledge, but also to do market analysis. So this is in Ireland, obviously you can run this for your local area. But I've just done Oracle Functional Analyst, and I can see four jobs. So, and they're all from Morgan McKinley. So they're uh, obviously um, these guys have a couple of roles, uh, so I can figure out what kind of jobs are out there. Let's say, and um, LinkedIn's kind of job functionality has been developing over, over time, whereas before it was just kind of basic jobs search. Now you can apply, and there's you can save, and uh, because I've been building up my network for a long time. If I want to, if I was particularly interested in this job, let's say I could approach the connections that I have there. So these are recruitment people who are building their network by inviting me. And one of the benefits of that is that uh, I can see them as a connection. And if I was interested in this job, I could approach them directly and, and sort of um, without just applying blindly, let's say. So this is one of the ways that I do market analysis in uh, within LinkedIn. The second way I'm not sure if you've seen is that I can see um, uh, about who's publishing new posts. Uh, the other thing I could see is that if a person who's in my network moves to a new client, so if I know an Oracle EBS functional guy, even if I'm out of touch with them, which is the, the best thing about LinkedIn is that you don't have to be mailing people every five minutes uh, or, or even um, even once a month is that you can see when they're moving around. So and if an Oracle functional guy that I know moves to a new client, immediately that's a lead for me because now I know, let's say I'm going to finish in January. So if someone starts at a new client, I can, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to get back in touch and meet them for a coffee and ask them what kind of opportunities are there in uh, in that client. So the, the, it, it would be very difficult to stay in touch with everyone that you've ever worked with um, to, to kind of to keep those relationships going. But LinkedIn, you can sort of do that automatically. And that's, uh, that was part of the market analysis that I did. So secondly then, um, I've been doing some, you can do some company searches as well, and as I said, just on the connections as well to kind of figure out what, how, where people are moving to, and that's a good indication that a project's starting. Yeah. Then we talked about job, job boards. So the one I, I have been using since I started in consulting is JobServe, but there are various different um, boards that would be more relevant for your area. I know the US Monster is a good one. Um, it's kind of a case of, for the keywords that you're searching for to sort of uh, to, to soak it and see and, and sort of figure out what kind of traffic in terms of jobs are going on the job boards. Um, but if I just re refer to Connor's point earlier, recruiters are, for me, they're my sales partner because as an IT person, number one, I do my job. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite busy and even though I enjoy the networking and stuff, to work with a recruiter and to find, to find and develop a relationship with a recruiter could last, which could, could last over your entire career is a, is a task well worth doing because a recruiter will kind of know, they'll definitely know more about the market than you. They'll, um, they'll know kind of what your skills are, where you might fit, fit in, and that's why I really recommend finding out, um, using job boards maybe as a backup, but to contacting your two or three recruiters in your local area that you've built up the relationship with and that you feel will represent you best, okay? So then um, the other thing, that, the other ways that I do market analysis then is that Oracle Music Group events. So we had uh, Seth and Connor attend an Oracle Music Group event uh, last week and it's, it was the news from Oracle, Oracle Open World. Um, and, uh, I guess this is a in the Oracle 
uh, events, the local Dublin events, we'll have a, an Oracle eBusiness suite track. So basically, I'll spend the day in that room and I'll talk to the speakers and I'll kind of have a look around and try and figure out who people are. Everyone has a badge, so it, it's, it's not unheard of to walk around, have a look at pe people's badges, write the names down, go and look them up on LinkedIn if you don't want to uh, approach them directly. And most people are friendly, they're at a conference, they want to, to network, and, um, and this is a, a really useful way of kind of building up your market knowledge on which clients have uh, Oracle EBS, and therefore, again, these are a source of leads for you. Um, the other one then that I found is useful is that we have our first Oracle uh, meetup group. It's started relatively recently. Um, and I think it's it's kind of indicative of the way that the recruitment landscape is changing. It's becoming more social now. And the Oracle user group website, I mean, there are very few people who actually go to the Oracle user group website to see what's new. Whereas if you're on meetup.com, you might be looking at it to, to play tennis or to look at your social groups or whatever, and it's, it's just a, a different way and I think a more successful way of getting people more engaged. So when I've been talking to some of you guys about coaching, I've had a look um, at your local meetup groups, especially in the US. There's quite a lot of meetup group activity around Oracle user groups and Oracle applications user groups. So I recommend just go to meetup and find your local groups and start attending the events. So what you, what you, you need to do is to kind of build up your own profile to sort of figure out what the market's about, who the players are, who the companies are, who the industry, who the successful Oracle people are in the industry. And the best way to do that is to go to the meetup events and to, to kind of, uh, to, to figure out what's going on. Um, Connor, I think you, you, that, that's worked out well for you as well, really, hasn't it, to get involved in the local Oracle community? No, definitely. I, I like going because um, usually kind of the best um, candidates would be very interested in technology and things that are happening and they don't really stand still. So people like those events, the kind of people you want to work with. And sometimes you go and you say people are like, oh, I'm just coming with a friend or I'm just here to find out a little bit of information about this and you have a chat with them and then, you know, next time you're talking on the phone or you're, you're emailing, it's like, oh, it's actually, you know, you've a bit of a relationship built up and that helps. Yeah. And it's, it's a two-way street. Um, so they, they, you know, the, the, the person applying for the job or wants to work with you will know you live better and you'll know them better as well. So and yeah, mm -hmm. a bit of fun as well usually, you know, a bit of crack. So you can always kind of yeah. get to know people. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, there's often a social uh, um, uh, aspect as well. So I guess um, some of the drinks uh, parties after after the Oracle user groups have have been a really good source of, of networking for for myself as well. So I guess there's nothing better after after a long day of of, of kind of sitting in. Uh, listening to the latest in EBS and cloud is is to actually go and and chat with the with the speakers and with the other delegates and uh, in a more sort of relaxed environment and that's often where the best uh, information can be can be got you know where it's a, a less formal environment people take their badges off and they just chat about kind of the problems that they're facing in Oracle functional or or whatever so it's it, it's well worth your time. Uh, just as a tip, putting in the extra few hours to go to the post social and kind of hang around after it because that's when you, uh, as Connor mentioned, you, you kind of build up uh, almost a, a personal relationship with people. I well, definitely agree with that. Like, I mean, you know, I wouldn't really drink a lot, to be honest. Like, it's not like go and have a few beers. It's, it's more about go and get a water and have a chat and, and you do find out a lot more and the barriers go down. So, and those kind of things is actually when um, you can actually meet hiring managers as well, and you know people will be really interested and in, in things like that as well. So that's that's a good opportunity, I'd say, uh, to do that. Okay, yeah. So then, um, from a CV point of view, uh, obviously it's a key point of, um, in terms of, of of getting hired. I mean, uh, Connor, would would you say the CV is still like your one of your pillars of, of getting skills across, or, or is it a combination of CV and LinkedIn, or are or, or things changing in, in that respect? 
Um, well, what I'd say is, if, if you're if you're trying to build a relationship with a recruiter, the CV is important, but not you know the end of the world. Like you have a chat and you meet in person and you do things like that, but the CV is very important when, and um, let's say there's a job open and okay, it's a great work of functions, financial job, and you're talking to the hiring manager. That that CV is he'll spend 30 seconds looking at it and usually to make a decision. So it needs to be pristine, and that's when they make the decision. And on the phone or when you meet the manager, you can tell them all the great things about the candidates, but. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, sometimes decisions are just made on CVs, um, regardless mm -hmm. of those factors. And um, so that's why it needs to be really good um, to make sure that's there as well. And there's a few different things and tri tips and tricks to go through as well. And um, like I would, I wouldn't really when I get a CV and I, I read through it quite carefully and I'd understand it. But some other recruiters would usually scan it as well, unfortunately. And um, so sometimes you just need to make sure you have the right information in the right places to get their attention, because some people won't be as as thorough and they'll they'll just say, okay, it doesn't have this specific module and Oracle Financials and don't bother contacting. When actual fact, mm -hmm. you might have it, but it might not just be listed on the CV. And um, so yeah. things like that can really, you have to make sure to, to know kind of that kind of information to make sure you benefit yourself and kind of getting that, that, that job and that interview as well. Yeah, and uh, the second thing is that uh, the style of CV, um, I think, uh, can be can, can vary to, depending on, on, on what what global location you have. So I, I have seen in, in the US particularly kind of leaning towards shorter CVs. And it, if you read general ads on LinkedIn, they'll say, oh, your CV should be two pages. But from the recruiters that I've spoken to, I think generally tend to favor uh, a long, more long form CV format, like the four and five pages. What's your opinion on that? Oh, I, I way prefer the longer CVs. Um, the reason is, let's say I have a job open, and it's um, mm -hmm. say, it was a good example earlier. You had like a migration project, and um, the company are going to want somebody with migration project experience. And if I go to, you know, I've got let's say a few candidates here, and I've got ten CVs. I'm okay. I've talked to these guys, and and I can read through the CVs. Then I'm like, okay, this guy candidate A did migration project here, did migration project here. That means um, that she or he is going to be the best fit for that job. So when I have all that information, I can match up a little bit better. And when I call the candidate, like, oh, look, you've done these great migration projects, and there's a really cool migration job happening here, what would you think? It's it's just better for everybody, you know? And the only thing I'd say about a short CV is um, the short CVs usually go for the, the lower-end jobs and also for the, okay. let's say, um, if you're a graduate, it makes sense. Like, you know, you haven't really done much usually if you're, if you're mm. a fresh grad. But if you you know worked at say five years plus, it should be three or four pages, and just listening through. Some people what they do is have a short CV and a long CV, and if a recruiter says I want your short CV, usually they're just going to send it on without kind of going through it. To be honest with you, I'd say, yeah. Um, you know, just give me the, the bones and I'll flip it over. They don't really take the thorough care to go through it and understand it and make it better. They just want to get it get it over to the the people as quick as possible. So I don't think with Oracle Functionals financials like they'd be more higher end jobs, and uh, if you put a bit of time into the CV. You're going to get a better response uh, from, okay. from everyone in general. Okay, that makes sense. And I mean, uh, the people who know uh, the best ty types of uh, CV to use in, in your local market or for the jobs that you're aiming for are the recruiters. So again, it, it, it's back to this point of finding a recruiter that you can personally get on with if that's a, a good guy in the market and developing the relationship with them because again these guys are the best sales people that, that they're they're way better at selling you than you are yourself uh, is what I found in most cases so the, again it's kind of developing the relationship working with your recruiter taking their advice on what this, the best style of CV is and, and, and uh, kind of working on, on that basis then so, so um, one, one, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah no, I, I, there's one, one bugbear of every recruiter, and there's a CV style called Europass. And <laughs> I've heard recruiters just throwing the CV out when it's in that format. So um, I don't know if anybody uses that format, but uh, I would suggest kind of not using that one. Um, it's just one used okay. on the con European continent, and everybody just okay. really doesn't like it at all. Um, and mm. everyone, like, CV has been deleted because they use Europass, even if the person has been great. It's just, it's just a, something like that. So I, I'd really recommend not using that one. I just thought I'd bring it up just in case anybody had it um, because it, 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 it's a bit of an issue. Okay, sounds good. Uh, those of you who have done the, the coaching with, so uh, one of the things that we concentrate on the coaching is, uh, first of all, working out what, what your three-year goals are, are going to be. So you. you should be thinking about your CV from that perspective. Does your CV say 
these are the types of roles that I'm interested in. These are the ones that I'm, 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 I'm uh, kind of aiming for, and this is my personal interest, my area of passion in Oracle, let's say. And the other thing you've got to figure out is what are my strengths. So again, from the people have done the coaching, we've kind of we've drilled down on, on kind of what your top three strengths are. And again, this should come through in your CV because if your if your if your CV, your LinkedIn profile, and your 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 kind of your preparation for an interview are are congruent, as in they all kind of reflect the same thing, you will come across as a strong candidate. You'll come across as someone that knows what they're talking about. And it's just don't forget to update your CV to kind of you may have written it many years ago. I'm sort of guilty. Uh, of that myself because I've been at Pfizer so long to review your CV in terms of what are your strengths, what if they've picked up stuff in the last couple of years, uh, that's that's kind of interesting. Have you incorporated that in your CV and your LinkedIn profile? So, uh, Connor, you wrote a very um, uh, interesting LinkedIn post about five ways to improve your CV in 15 minutes. Uh, Maybe you could just relate those uh, those kind of five ways, and we'll we'll, we'll carry on from there. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, a lot of the the, the those five points, and I'm sure Aidan can send the article on afterwards, and it'll all be there. And I did a video about it as well. And um, but it, it's mostly kind of stuff. Everyone's like, oh yeah, it's so obvious. But um, stuff like Arial font, um, ten, eleven, twelve kind of size as well. Um, that's pretty key. Um, check the spelling. Now, sometimes what happens is people uh, format the CVs um, and they write it in English, and they, but they do it in Word, but maybe they're in you know China or something. So when they check the Word, it doesn't always work out the right way. And um, so you need to make sure that that um, you know that you do check that. That's really important. To be honest, sometimes when people like one or two spell spellings happens to everybody, but if it's more than that, um, it just looks kind of unfortunately careless. And I've had hiring managers saying, "I'm not even that person." goes based on the what mm -hmm. they've written on the C V because it's misspellings or bad grammar or things like that. Mm -hmm. Now appreciate, you know, it can be tricky to do that, so I'd always get say get a friend to look it over. That's the recruiter usually actually is a good idea. Like I'd always check that really thoroughly as well and make sure it's well formatted uh, as well. And sometimes people kind of decide they want a really different C V. So a good example is actually in, in there's an area called front end development, developing UI and they always do their CVs very differently, and they're cool. Yeah. But in Oracle Financial Functional, usually it's just like, like I can send a CV template afterwards. You don't need to, you know, change the world or put in any pictures or kind of cool graphics. You just have the information there as well. It'd be good. I appreciate some guys are also uh, maybe coming from abroad, and I'd always say your visa situation, and uh, because sometimes that can be kind of tricky because sometimes like look we can only have people coming from a certain area, but if you're from abroad and you really want to move to Ireland, I would put that in there. And um, I would also say stuff like, look, I appreciate I'm coming from a different country and I need a visa sponsorship and I'm really interested and I can be flexible in terms of um, showing you my value and, and things like that. I put in the CV as well um, because I, I have I know loads of good guys uh, from abroad and unfortunately just can't sometimes get them a job because of the visa. But if you're going for the local area ones, you should be fine. But that's, if you're going to Europe or America um, and you're coming from like, somewhere, somewhere like Asia, it can be kind of tricky. Um, mm -hmm. other, other tips. What did I, what did I have written down? Oh yeah, there's a, there's a way you can. So when you write a word, let's say like a technology, so if you wrote down e-business, that's actually in the English language dictionary. So you need to add it. So that removes the squiggle underneath. It's a really small thing, but if you think about information you get, if it's a lot of you know red lines underneath things, you don't usually uh, think positively. So I'd say that would be a good thing to do as well. Um, like I said, four or five pages. Kind of talked about that earlier. Uh, good project examples. I'm always interested in project examples. Usually, a lot of my job is actually matching up projects from candidates. That's what I'm really interested mm -hmm. in. Um, put all the information on. So things like contact details, so phone numbers, um, email addresses. Actually, phone numbers is an interesting one. So if you're, let's say, based in uh, Brazil and you're applying for a job in the US, if you can possibly get a US cell phone number, that would be really good because. Um, a lot of people sometimes just discard TVs when they see the the, po the phone code not being local. Um, it's a really small thing. Like you can have the phone number there, and you might not use it, or you might not have to sell. But usually, you can get these like cheap pay as you go ones. Even you can get them on the post. I think if you go online, um, they have quite good. That's be quite a good idea. Obviously, the address as well. You know, <laughs> it could be kind of tricky. But if you, if you do the phone number, it's the first step. And um, references as well. Usually, I, I looked if when people have like the names and phone numbers listed in the, in the CV, I'm like, oh, this is a good person. Like they're really confident in the references. Uh, that's really good sign of quality work. So I always like that as well. 
Um, because usually people say like reference available on request, and usually you do need them in the end anyway. But if people put it down straight away in the CV, I'm like that's a good plus mm -hmm. sign for me anyway. Because um, mm -hmm. as I said, you can see that work. Um, I'm trying to think that's it. Yeah, that's about it. I'd say really. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, a skills summary at the top. That's really good as well. Yeah. So sometimes people put down, um, you know, I'm 15 years work at Oracle Financials Functional, and working with these modules. But what actually sometimes happens is you've worked with these three modules for 10 years and these two other modules for five years or whatever. So mm -hmm. you're really strong in one or two areas or in some other areas. You've, you've got some niche skills as well. So I would showcase that at the top uh, because sometimes if you're reading a CV, you're like, oh, I don't know if they're an expert at supply chain management or financials. Well, I don't know what area they're really into or what area of model the experience mm -hmm. is in because if you just put it down, I've worked in these modules, then it can be kind of hard. Well, you call them and ask them, but uh, it's probably better for everybody. I don't want to call somebody like, hey, here's a supply chain job. Like, well, I used it for six months, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. and that's not really you know, yeah. always bad. And, um, so that's what I, I'd recommend that as well. And I always have to see like this list of skills and the user experience. And then sometimes people might put down like, oh, I worked on this project with a skill. That's really cool. That's really good. Because then if you, you know, if I have, let's say, a Greenfield project and you've got on your CV, you've got, I worked with um, Oracle Business, um, I say Oracle HR, I worked at Oracle HR in a Greenfield project, and um, I did it for two years. I'm like, bingo, like that's the right person for this job. And when I call a person, it's like, it's really warm, because I'm like, look, this is a really good experience matching this job. And usually they're kind of interested as well. So that's a good way to be able to match up those things. I appreciate not everyone might have Oracle business functional experience from the get-go, but if you do list your other skills there as well, and something like project management, or I managed an e-business project, or I am... Um, worked on developing a, a project. That's the kind of stuff I would suggest as well. And I have a CV template. I'll, I'll send it to Aidan and you guys. You want to as well. And it's kind of all those bits and pieces I talked about there. It's already laid out in it. So basically, if you have a current CV and you just you can just take all the information and type it out or transfer it over, let's say, and then format it. It's all formatted correctly. Now, some, sometimes local recruiters might have their own, oh, this manager likes um, you know, something on page three, he wants mm -hmm. like to see something or she wants to see something, then I would adjust it for that as well. And, yeah, that's kind of all the stuff I'd say on the, on the CV anyway. Um, so I, I, I liked Aidan's point earlier about, like, it's a partnership. It's They're going to sell you better than you can ever do yourself. And I was like, yeah, it's actually probably true. And um, so the more time and effort you put in the CV, it, it kind of just benefits you that you're more likely to get an interview. So I gave the CV template to one or two people uh, when I was developing it, and then they went and applied for the jobs, and they got way more interviews. Well, they got bite backs, I'd say, from recruiters and from companies being interested. I like the skill set was the same. It's just better highlighted and better formatted and easier to read. Mm -hmm. They actually got the interviews based off that. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Cause I was like, it's actually sometimes about um, just presenting it in the way you present it. Um, and the information is also there as well. So that was kind of good. Yeah, that's true. Plus, a well-presented CV plus LinkedIn profile is a good in, in, in indication of how you'll be able to present information to your manager and to your business partners as a functional consultant. So, for uh, technical roles, let's say that that uh, mightn't be as important, but for functional consultant, they often ask for strong communication skills, and to have all of that lined up. Uh, to have a jump off the page, what your strengths are, what your skills are, what your goals are, is, is a really good uh, uh, positive. It puts the hiring manager in the right frame of mind, let's say, about you as a person and how you're going to be uh, to communicate with. Um, I just had a few tips in general, Aidan, for working with recruiters. Mm -hmm. I know we might we'll run over a bit of time. Is it okay if I go with that now and just go for that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, yeah, so, I mean, when, when working with recruiters, there are just some good things to do, I'd say, and that will kind of make them kind of want to get you the job even more, work harder for you, let's say. It's, and just as first thing is just be very honest as well. So some people would say, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a... Uh, going for your job and I'm really interested in it. Okay, here's the interview. Like, no, I'm actually not I'm actually that interested. That That's very frustrating um, because you've managed it well and got that. I know people are busy and change their minds, but if you highlight all those things up front to be better, uh, if you're going away or going traveling, yeah, just say that. You know, some people wouldn't mention that, but I think that's important to know as well. Um, you know, I, and just be just be honest with what you want to do and what, what you want to say as well. Um, sometimes people get frustrated with recruiters because they don't hear back from them. Unfortunately, some mm -hmm. people do that and it, it is annoying. And you, sometimes you can feel like you're putting your CV forward and you're never hitting back. Um, I would always email back personally, but if you're if you, that keeps happening, um, I would just call them and ask them. And maybe they don't answer the call, they don't answer the email, but 
after that and you you probably won't work with them and they're probably not going to work with you so I wouldn't worry about that too much but I know that can be frustrating um, I I try and get back to everyone in every 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 day usually I keep in contact maybe just send an email just keep in touch but I, I don't know if other recruiters kind of do that unfortunately so I, I just be patient there and what I would do is if I'm talking and it's like okay I'll send my CV for you and maybe if, if you're proactive and say by Thursday Friday, when do you think you get feedback and my person might say Wednesday it's like okay cool what time on Thursday can we do a call and then you put that in your own diary. So I think that would be a good thing to do as well. So that's kind of good. Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, we can follow up that way. And then um, I find that, yeah, so that's like, that's the kind of way it works. I try and meet people as much as possible. But sometimes, you yeah. know, if you suggest to Skype yourself, like oh, if, if if somebody says, like, I really want to meet you, Skype you, I personally always try and say yes as much as possible to that because they're putting the time into kind of meeting you, understanding what your needs are, and that's kind of um, an investment of time on their behalf. So obviously, they want to help you as much as possible, but if you're getting like five recruiters saying that, I know it can be difficult to meet all of them, mm-hmm. but maybe pick the best two or three and try and meet them as well. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I've had a great relationship with people. I could bring them out and bring them out for lunches and kind of celebrate and keep in contact with people as well. So, you know, always keep in contact with a few guys as well. Maybe, um, it, you know, the person might not got you a job this time or it didn't work out, but who knows, a year or two down the line, they might have something perfect for you. So just try and keep in contact. Like LinkedIn, like Aiden said, is really good for stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so just to summarize, I'd say definitely be very honest about everything, and um, you know, not to hide. If you just flag everything from the start, you know, it should be grand. Or look, say I'm looking for a salary like this. No, no, or I'm not too sure what I'm looking for. Give me some advice. I'd say that as well. And then um, yeah, all those other points as well. I think if you do that, um, you'll have a really good relationship with the recruiter, and they'll work your, their socks off to try and get you that job, or get you more jobs as well, and the best, best salary or rate, whatever you can get as well. Okay, that's a great wrap up. Uh, I just had a couple of questions. One from uh, Yemi. Yemi, if you want to uh, just ask your question for Connor. Hi, Connor. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My question is this: How very important is your job title? Uh, the reason why I'm asking this is I once had a recruiter that came to me and said, "You're very perfect for the job." Everything you do is just perfect and perfect fit for this job. But your job title, mm, so I don't know. How very important is the job title? I, I wouldn't say it's that important, really. I, I'm kind of, I'd be very surprised that, like, that's very um, um, high-level stuff. I mean, if you're perfect for the job, like, I mean, I could do a job and call a project manager, and you could do the same job and call a business analysis. It's, it's still the same job. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't buy that, to be honest with you, sorry. I think that's a bit silly. Um, yeah, actually, I'll just I'll just let you know what most of the recruiters how they work, right? So if you submit your CV, it goes into a database, and then the recruiter gets the job in, and then they take the keywords from the job specs. This is what most people do now, and they type it into a database, and then they get the top ten CVs, and they call all those people. So if you have kind of loads of information in your CV, you're going to go up the rankings as well and get that call. So just come back to the thing about the job title. When he put in probably the job title uh, into the, into the search. You might not have come first, and that's why you, the, the recruiters were like, "Oh, I'm not so sure." That might have been the reason why. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, uh, because one of the reasons why I'm asking is this: I work as an application analyst, and mm-hmm. even though I work more with the Oracle side of things, or I once got a job which was for defect manager, and the guy was like, "You're very perfect for the job because that's what I do most times." Uh, in my day-to-day job, I am most likely fixing defects uh, for projects and upgrade and things like that. But my job title is application analyst, so and I'm like, how am I going to work around this? What do I do? So, could you, could you, maybe just next time I say, just say, look, what job title should I have, and then just put on the CV. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much, you know. Um, you know, nobody's going to call a company like, is this her true job title? You know, I don't, I wouldn't worry about that too much if they say it's. You need to put it down as application developer instead of application analysis, and it's the same work. Then I, I would just change it on the CV. Yeah, I did you know. say that, but I, I was worried. It say just put defect manager. I said that's not my job title. What happens if a reference is being, you know, sought from my current employer, and they said no because I've had that before. They will tell you was this person's job title. So that's why I'm being very careful about that. No, maybe the best thing for you then it would be to if you're talking to recruit like yeah, I want to go forward for this job and I want to look at my CV and in terms of the job title what do you think I should put down and then whatever they suggest I I maybe go for that because uh, okay. they might they might know the hiring manager like that sometimes happens like they have the little quirks oh I'd never hire an analyst for 
developer position where in reality it's the same job. So, you know, that's why you just got to kind of build that relationship and they'll give you that information because they want to get you the job as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Hopefully you answered it. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Shastri, you had a question as well, did you? I'm afraid I can't. We can't hear you. I don't think. Okay. Uh, uh, like I don't know uh, what is the problem. Yeah. Uh, on my. Do you want to maybe type out the question and then maybe Aiden can read it out, um, and then yeah. I can hopefully, if you guys can hear us, then you can go through that way. Yeah, so uh, while I wait for uh, Shastri to uh, type the question in, um, I see a couple yes, more yes. people have joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I, I, think I sent uh, my question. Uh, By WhatsApp. Yeah. That one, if, that is, if that is addressed later. Well, let's go for that now. So uh, we were talking about uh, remote jobs. So, uh, Connor, have you seen any uh, remote jobs to, to to work from home? I mean, I, I think with the with the the more flexibility and and work from home, this is something the candidates are are particularly interested in. Have you seen a, a movement towards that, or are our clients open towards that that working remotely? Uh, definitely, yeah. Um, so what would that be in the Irish? Microphone is talking, really. Uh, I don't know. Shastri, could you be able to go on mute? Now, now we definitely can hear you. <laughs> um, yeah, so in the Irish market, we're seeing a lot of um, jobs being outsourced, and that's one of the trends. Another trend would be definitely more remote work. And so I think, though, there's a kind of a bit of a misconception that remote working is full-time remote working. That's That's very difficult mm -hmm. to get. Um, unless you've been in a company for a while, someone like Aiden who you know, has, a, has a lot of trust from Pfizer and they understand how good he is. Um, but usually it'd be like, it might start off like one day a week. And a lot of people might have families as well and they want to be there for their kids and completely get that. Or if they're traveling, you know, from somewhere to work, they're doing Monday to Friday during the week, so they want a day at home. And that Most companies are very open to doing that. Um, during the initial, like, month or two, they probably wouldn't be, just so you build up the relationship and the trust. A good example, actually, in our company, we've got here, he, he actually lives three hours away. And he's oh, in right. most area. He's working three hours away. He spends two days in the office here, and yeah. every week. And then in six months, he'll be full time out. So he won't be in the office at all, and just be phone calls. So companies are doing things like that. And in the IT sector, yeah. that's going to happen more and more. Um, we've talked to companies, and they're talking about skill shortages, and they're saying, I was saying, like, if you want to get better candidates, if you're more flexible about working, like even one day a week, they're they're really interested. So I think one of the issues is that their security on their databases and security on their, yeah. on their systems in general is, is only improving now. So I think we'll see definitely 2017 will be a more push towards that, um, doing that, and then people can log on at home and do their thing. And like, like look us now, we're all in different countries doing different things, but um, you know we can all dial in and do things. So yeah, definitely very good. But if you're going to a recruiter, um, I would say you know you just tell them like, okay, I, working from home is a, is a deal breaker for me. And that's really important. And just flag that at the very first. Don't wait the whole interview, and then at the very end, be like, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Take, offer me the job. Go back and ask for mm -hmm. homework." And I, I wouldn't do mm -hmm. that. I think that would uh, that would uh, sour some relationships there. So I would, mm -hmm. I would more go for that. And if you say, "Look, I, I need a day a week, or two days a week, or three days a week," just say that as well. I think that would work out well for everybody. Okay, that sounds good. I think that's what uh, Shastri is saying is that he he sees opportunities on uh, for for support being being pushed to offshore, and in fact, I actually got an offer to work for a UK company at permanent as a support person. So, um, but to to work a hundred percent remotely. So let's say you you could foresee going over to the office for two weeks at the start to get your accesses and get your laptop and everything and then to basically move from uh, and to work remotely. So uh, that was the first one that, that I'd seen, but um, I think it's an uh, indication of, of, of the, the, the way the, mar the market's going. Um, the only thing that w w worried me about that job description was, was that they asked for uh, the ability to check email queues and stuff basically on, on a 24-hour basis. So um, there's 
uh, a sort of a quid pro quo, let's say. So um, you might be able to work from home, but they, they, they might expect you to answer emails late at night, let's say, which in a normal uh, travel to site job, you, you possibly wouldn't be wouldn't be asked to do that. So. Um, so uh, I guess it's about kind of considering the, the remote uh, option as uh, how it will impact on your on your relationships, on your family life. Do you have a working? Uh, do you have an office or a working space available? Are you going to have to work on the same time zone that the, that the client is on? These these are, are kind of variables that you would need to think carefully. I think about before committing to what appears like the utopia of the uh, of working from home. So, um, memory or Rob, thanks you guys for joining. Now. I'm not sure if, if if you guys had any questions. You feel free to take yourself off mute and ask, or else you can type them into the box. Uh, in the meantime, Shastri, you can try again if if you like. Yeah, uh, I, I think the remote option I mentioned. It is in terms of project management, not with respect to uh, database access. Uh, probably that is a future where it, 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 that is a potential which is being seen. And uh, that article I was reading it, and probably I was just trying to know uh, your opinion, and uh, that's all on that. So I was considering the uh, project management as a possible potential options. Yeah, I mean. Um... I guess to, to all to all intents and purposes, I am an offshore or a remote project manager because for the last number of years I haven't I've not done any travel since 2012, and because I work with U.S. clients, they never ask me to go so far to the U.S. So it, essentially, it is an offshore project management role. So I have a development team that work in India, and I talk to them every day. And they work my GM. They work my hours six until three o'clock, and then so in the mornings I work with those guys, and in the afternoons then I work with the US uh, people who are on the east coast. So um, I will work with them between lunchtime and around five or six. So I mean, um, I guess it's. It, it is possible because uh, I mean uh, we, we have people on this call from various places in the U.S. and from India and uh, and from all over the place. So there, there isn't anything to to stop you doing project manager management on on a remote basis. So yeah, I, I think it's 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 definitely possible, and that's it, that these are the kind of roles that I, I would be interested in. So, um, memory or Rob, any questions from you guys? Yeah, actually, how's it going? It's Rob. Hey, Rob. Hi, uh, hey. Um, I was, oh, was going to ask you. Um, oh, I, I have a primarily support back, background, Oracle support, fin financials, and I just was wondering um, my approach if, you know, if they see you as, uh, if I'm going for an upgrade or an implementation, it's, uh, it's it seems like it's kind of hard to, to go that route if you've been doing, you know, uh, one thing for a while. I mean, I started off as in the business side and then went over to, to support, but I was just wondering if, my, if it, is there a, a good approach to switching? So I mean, um, what I did when I switched was I switched from uh, from t technical to functional, and what I what we're trying to do in the course is to is to figure out what the skills are in your target area. So if there's six key functional skills of objectives, requirements, design, build, test, and transition, you've got to figure out which ones of those six key skills in your target area, whatever that job is. What are the key skills in that area, and which ones of those do I have already, and has my strengths? So if that's three or two out of those key skills in the target job, let's say for instance it's a functional job, 
then you kind of work on building and expanding your, uh, sorry, re refreshing your memory on, on instances where you've worked in, in those six key skills. And then you, you go to your, to your honest, I think, with the recruiter with, in your CV and in your LinkedIn, and you say, right, I understand functional requires these six key skills. Not all projects do. These are the ones that I'm strong in. This is the areas where you could really depend on me for a functional role and then sort of work on, on, on that basis. So that's what I did was I'd, I was open when I moved from technical to functional. I said I'm, I'm more of a, a design and a build guy, which is two of the key skills. I had a little bit of test as well. And the first role that I had was kind of built around built around those those kind of key skills. So while I, while I had problems in the other skill, in the other areas, I was still able to survive because I had my cornerstone skills. So it's kind of working out what your strengths are, uh, for, work, knowing what the target the target jobs key skills that are required, and being able to identify instances from your past or from your experience, and being able to sort of emphasise those. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, definitely. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I mean, uh, it seems we've got a, a couple of people who who, who do support. I know Sh Sh Shastri works in in support. Um, memory. Did did you have any questions, or are you, are you happy enough with uh, with what's been discussed so far? Maybe we've we've sort of covered your questions already. It's just a good opportunity to have when we have Connor on the call. I sent in a, I typed you the this question that I have. Oh yeah, I see. Oh sorry, now I see it. Yeah. So what you're saying, memory, is you'd like to know how much opportunities there are. Someone coming from a non-functional um, experience without experience in a functional role, but but you, you have some functional training, memory, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, Connor, this is kind of a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, basically, m memory is, it is coming from the from the business team. So she's a, a an ERP uh, finance person, I think. And mm -hmm. what I've noticed is that there are people who can, who in my in the in the five or six project managers that I mentioned, who remain on my team, the ones that have lasted through all the years. Three out of six of those came from the business community, so they weren't functional people, they weren't technical people, they were business people who got an opportunity to work on a project and sort of grab the opportunity with both hands and then change their careers from being business people into Oracle functional people. And I know for a fact that a lot of the functional skills, being able to have the business liaison to know what the customer wants, that these are actually very useful skills from a, a, a functional point of view. So uh, I guess, I mean, Connor, would you have a, I mean, have you seen that before where, where people transfer in from, from the business into sort of functional roles, kind of leaning on their, on their business experience and, and making that jump? No, definitely, completely. That happens all the time. I was just thinking today, like, you know, no, no, not many children go out, oh, I really want to, you know, work with Oracle business. It's usually something sometimes people just fall into by accident. They're mm -hmm. interested in IT, they join a company, they they work with Oracle. That's sometimes usually what happens. There's a few kind of backgrounds that they do quite well with Oracle Functional, and it's mostly kind of accountants or people working for finance and seem to really enjoy Oracle Finance Functional because they would use the software at the start and, you know, they'd use kind of um, A or AP or something like that and they develop, get more interested in how it's all developing in the background and kind of get into that way and they're saying, oh, we need someone with basis user experience. So sometimes I get demands from hiring hiring managers and companies saying, we want to work with functional financials or we want, mm -hmm. let's say, supply chain, but we want somebody who used to be an accountant and used to be a business user as well and actually... Yeah. That means that those candidates with it, with that pass is actually going to, they're going to be a lot stronger and they get paid a bit extra for that as well, and um, because there's not as many of those people there that have kind of followed through and kind of done all the training and things like that. Um, like you made a good point earlier when you said the functional jobs are definitely um, better paid. I think than definitely than the developer jobs, and the developers would sometimes just be coders that go into coding specifically for e business, but the functional guys or the functional kind of people would be more um, kind of yeah, business people really and then go into it. It's not, yeah. it's, it's all, usually it's never the coders change into the functional people. Usually it's the business people going to functional. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, I, me, me personally, because I, I transferred from technical into functional, out of the six key skills, the business skills are my weakest skills. I, I, I find there are conversations around finance that I have with with, function, with business users as a functional person where I, I often come out of the meeting and call, I wish I understood a bit more about finance and uh, the, the uh, accounting aspects of finance, let's say, because it would make me a lot better at my job. And what business people don't realize is that the actual the advantages that they have coming into the functional role, memory are significant for in for the parts of a project which require liaison with the business and uh, customer facing because you, with your knowledge of processes, you will understand the language that people are talking about. You're going to get it. You're going to get and understand what they're talking about far easier than a guy who's moved in from technical to functional, let's say. And that's I have had problems in the past with that understanding parts of processes. And you, it's, it's, it, the business people often don't realize how, how powerful and how useful they can be on projects because they have this business background. Uh, I think if we, if you remember at the start of the call, we looked at a couple of, uh, of roles on LinkedIn and one, at least one or two of them mentioned you have to be a qualified accountant. And there are no Oracle technical people that are, qualified accountants, it just doesn't happen. So they come from the business, basically. Thank you. Okay. Um, memory, you're um, asking as well about what are the e-business training courses required prior to the functional scale. So, Connor, this is something that um, you might be able to provide your opinion on. I mean, in in terms of training, do, do people look for, do hiring managers look for business training courses? I mean, or do, do they look for, for certifications? Is that just for people who maybe are on the junior experience side, or how does that all, how does that all work together? Yeah, no. Um, so what happens usually is, let's say there's a new product brought out, like Oracle Fusion or Oracle Cloud or something like this, and you know nobody's really used it, but there's a new project coming up. If you get certified in that, that's really good because that means you'll probably get the job. Be realistic with you. Um, so if you identify an area like something like cloud, like I know Aidan's really mm -hmm. interested in that, and you get certified, you know there's only like maybe two or three guys in Ireland. Just just a good example, and um, who can do that, so you probably get that. Uh, so the best of that, if you're if you're a junior or let's say you're working in a different type of job and you're like you know or finance is functional, I'm really interested. Um, I would recommend getting a certification. Um, uh, probably I think there's one from Oracle University. I don't know. Probably Aidan knows a bit more than I would about that. Or doing the strain actually with Aidan is good as well, um, because you know the, there's not many entry level jobs um, in Oracle finance is functional that are just gonna be like okay you know you've got 10 years of something like here yeah, let's just go for that. They're more likely probably go for the fresh grad because they can train them in. Um, so if you show that commitment from your side of training courses that are going on, learning online or watching YouTube videos and things like that, then you, you should put that in your CV and highlight that so that the hiring manager knows. Um, so if you didn't have any experience at all, it definitely is highlighted when I'm kind of, let's say, selling the CV. Um, and if it's mm -hmm. good, you know, you've worked in the industry and you're a good personality fit and you've done a similar project, that's all good stuff as well. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. So if you can get them, the more the better. I'm always like, yeah, if we've got more certifications, the better, especially in niche areas that they're really interesting. So if you've got like a certification in like Oracle HR, that's really interesting because, um, you know, not a lot of people have that. And if it's an Oracle HR mm -hmm. project, you know, that's you're like top of the list then, you know, straight away. So that's kind of cool. Okay, sounds good. Any more questions then? So, uh, Shastri, um, do you want to go ahead and, pre and present, or would you prefer to hold off until the next call for the uh, information on, on, on uh, process and uh, discrete manufacturing? Okay, okay, that's fair enough. I think uh, we spent uh, the guts of uh, an hour and a half talking on, on this, and uh, from my point of view, it's been really great to get uh, Connor on the call. So Connor, thanks very much for uh, taking time at, at, out of your Saturday and for helping out with the, with the CV reviews. Um,
So just to to to, uh, to wrap up then, uh, what I need to follow up in, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send a mail with with uh, Connor's uh, LinkedIn details. I'm sure he won't mind if if, if you guys uh, c connect with him. Um, I need to send uh, the five points on LinkedIn articles. Uh, have a look at what Connor has written um, on uh, various parts of of the uh, of his his job um, and and sort of follow him as uh, as one of the the Ireland industry uh, um, personalities in recruitment. Let's say, Connor, I think you were going to send me the CV uh, template, which I forward on to the rest of the guys. And this might be a basis, uh, a CV template to start with, basically. But again, to to remember to to sort of find a couple of recruiters in your in your local area and sort of take their opinion on the the fine details, let's say, of of the CV. But I'm sure the the CV template will be um will be uh, accurate for for what kind of Oracle and functional jobs, let's say. Um. Yeah, thanks very much, Connor. I really uh, appreciate it. I think that that was really uh, interesting to 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 get your perspective. No, that sounds good. And um, you can, yeah, I'm happy to connect with any guys in LinkedIn as well. And I'll, you can send also the stuff trade. And if you if you if you do a little practice with it, and you write out the CV or you have some more questions, and um, just send the CV back to me, and I'll probably uh, find five minutes to give you a bit of advice. I I know somebody sent me a CV, I can't remember their name. And I wrote back about ten lines of of, of feedback, so I. I'm usually pretty good rather than sometimes some recruiters just write one line back, so that can be a bit frustrating. So I'm usually pretty good. Um, if you're interested in that, you can always, you can always do something there as well. Um, I might not always be the next day, but it'll definitely be within a week. Okay, sounds great. Just to, to, to wrap up the call from a housekeeping uh, perspective then, so the people who have um, joined the call today, so you get an email later on with the recording, so you can go back um, and have a listen to the recording. It's probably best if you if you download that recording to your laptop, you can get a free WebEx player um, uh, from WebEx.com to, to play the recording. So you'll have it then to go back and kind of review what we've uh, to discussed today and, and uh, Connor's uh, contributions and, and the questions from everyone. Um, so Jonah then uh, today or Monday will be sending out the details of the call. So we'll send out the deck uh, information on the recording again. And uh, thank you very much um, for attending. And I'll let you all go back to your Saturdays. And uh, we'll talk to you on the Facebook group. Don't forget, you can use the Facebook group to ask questions. Uh, the reason I, I prefer this uh, to direct email questions is that unless it's very personal to your situation, maybe use email. If it's not, I think we as a group get the kind of benefit from uh, sharing each other's uh, answers. And you, you can also, you can always pick up a lot of insight by looking at how I would respond to someone else and seeing are there any parallels between that and your situation. So I recommend the Facebook group or the WhatsApp group for, for asking questions. And if you need to approach me directly uh, about something that's particular to your situation, of course, you can do that as well. So again, thanks very much for taking time out of your Saturday. I'm going to close down the call now and we'll talk to you soon, okay? Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye.